Thanks a lot. And uh, hello, guys and girls. Sorry, uh, I don't think I can see any of you and you can't see see me all the time. So I'm going to try and take you through uh, a bit of a deeper understanding of decision making. But I'm going to try and simplify it as I go with some key lessons and some key takeaway messages. Um, as Gary said, if there's any questions you want to ask at the end, please feel free. Um, or of course, on social media at a later point, please feel free to drop me a message and I'm always happy to discuss. Um, so yeah, as Gary mentioned, the topic is decision making. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a background about myself. Uh, so first of all, like I'm a human that's passionate about positively influencing people. Uh, when people introduce themselves, I think as coaches, we try and go straight to the coaching points. But I think more importantly, as a person, I'm just passionate about positively influencing people. Uh, and then from a more formal route, uh, from education, I'm a UEFA license qualified, uh, master's and bachelor's degrees in sports science and coaching, uh, and then completed my FA Youth Award. Uh, from an experience perspective, uh, one of the key parts for me was uh, working for Foundation Sports as a PE teacher. I think in that time, I must have worked with at least 3,000 children. Um, that's an estimation, of course, but going, working with so many different children gave me lots of critical experience for then later on going to work uh, in a football environment. Uh, in terms of working with the youth, I worked with Watford Football Club as a sports scientist, um, Dagna Redbridge working as foundation phase lead and then across all the age groups between under seven and under 18. Uh, and then Tottenham Hotspur development program with children between three and 16. And then in regards to the senior uh, level, before I took a flight out to Zambia to work in the Premier League there, I took a amateur side called Hainaut FC in the Sunday League just to get that experience of working with senior players. It was voluntary. It was uh, the quality of football wasn't the best, but I had to learn to coach a 35 year old, for example, uh, which for anyone that's aspiring to work with senior players one day, try and get in and do it even if it's voluntary. Um, I then, as I said, I went to Zambia to be a head coach of Lusaka Dynamos in the Premier League there. Uh, I was 25 at the time, a crazy experience. I think I touched on it with Gary's uh, previous podcast, but yeah, very also critical experience for me. And then more recently, um, I worked with Orlando Pirates first team in under 23s um, as a coach and analyst. And I think sometimes the bit that we miss out is some of the important people that we've worked with along the way. Um, I'm probably heavily a product of the coaches that have either criticized me or or push me to be better or help me support me with session design and things like that. So there's lots of people on the right there that I, I try and place in the presentation just to give credit to those that have really uh, pushed and helped me excel. For those that are maybe newer to coaching or haven't worked around many different coaches before, uh, try and find some that are going to be very critical. Uh, I've had some criticize me to the level where I haven't spoke to them for a few days and I've thrown a strop at work, but it was such an important part of my development. So. If you get a chance to work with those coaches, uh, grab them with both hands. Um, so the objective of the webinar, most importantly, I'd like to try and influence some of the coaches to really rethink some of the beliefs and practices that you may have already um, and rethink our understanding of decision making. Uh, and I hope to do this by increasing the understanding of decision making and what exactly it is, um, share some practical methods to help influence decision making. Uh, and then have a look at decision making in early youth development and see how maybe the context changes. And then, of course, have a bit of a discussion at the end, hopefully, if there's any questions. So why am I a little bit obsessed with decision making? If obsessed can be taken as a positive word. Uh, I think from a young age, I've kind of been obsessed with the why of P why do people do things, um, which went through school and football. So in my classroom, I'd be wondering, why is the teacher setting this objective? Why are they making me read this book when I don't want to read this book? I had lots of questions around that. And then through football, I was a center back. And then the coach was making me stand in a line and do finishing. So I was questioning, why am I doing this? What's going on here? Which then took me into broader life and started into questioning why everyday people were doing some of the things they were doing. And then more formally, when I got to 16 and I took psychology as an A-level and then started going through my bachelor's and master's with more of a heavy emphasis on psychology, um, it enabled me to question why people do things. Then, of course, when you take that into practice and I started coaching, observing why players behaved the way they did on the pitch became a really critical question that I continued to ask. And what I found was that I wasn't so frustrated by the decisions they made and I was actually quite able to influence the decisions. Whereas other coaches that I was working with were maybe more frustrated with the decisions uh, and kind of looking at it in a negative perspective of oh, why is the player doing this? Why is he passing there? Why is he not dribbling? And I kind of always found it a positive challenge and an enjoyable one to try and influence the decisions they were making as opposed to a negative frustrating one. So if we then start to delve into decision making, 
if we try to put it in a simple term, I'd probably describe it as decision making is the selection of an action, whether it's conscious or subconscious. So if the if you do an action that you're not necessarily aware of at the time consciously, for example, you're scratching your head, um, or in football, the player finds themselves scanning, but they're not consciously thinking about it, it would still count as a decision, whether it's conscious and they're aware of it or it's subconscious. Uh, and then, of course, what's really important is when we talk about decision making, we're not just looking at the player on the ball. We are considering the decisions of the players off the ball. We're considering the, play, the decisions that are made in possession, out of possession, throughout the match. So to give you an example here, often when we talk about decision making, we'll look at this player here and kind of say, well, this is the player that needs to make the critical decision. But when we're now really going deep into decision making, we need to look and say, well, what if player B was to run here? How does that movement affect? impact the defender and how does that defender's movement impact player A's decision? How does player D's movement to support behind impact player A's confidence in terms of going 1v1? So we start after looking at decision making as an individual framework that affects the whole team and in creating cohesion between those movements and the individual decisions is what's key to having um, successful decision making and then getting development and results. So why is understanding decision making important? I'm going to break down uh, performance a little bit because to put it quite bluntly, our role as coaches fundamentally is to improve present or future performance. So whether we're great on the social corner and we work really well with children or the parents love us, fundamentally there's an expectation that players are going to, whether at professional level or youth level, are going to improve their performance in the short term or the long term or both. So if we now try and break down performance, performance is a summary of the decisions a player makes and, that ex and the execution of the actions they take. That's it. There's every single action a player takes will fit into the execution and then every single decision they make will fit in this box here. So this is the summary that tells us how well a player performs. And this is a two-way relationship. So here you've got decision-making, the selection of actions. Now, the more decision-making options you're aware of, obviously then the more ability you can execute or the more variety of abilities you can execute. So for example, if you're aware of the option of chipping the goalkeeper, of going through the legs or going around the keeper, that enables you now to execute a wider range of abilities. Similarly, if you've got the ability to do more things so you can play a variety of passes, you're now able to make a wide variety of decisions. For example, if you can play off the outside of your foot, it now makes you to make a decision to play around uh, a potentially a midfielder who's in front of you um, to try and break the line. So it's a two-way relationship. But of course, for the purpose of the, the webinar, we're going to focus on the decision-making element. So we're going to go through four topics. The first topic is decision-making systems. Uh, then we're going to look at the factors that influence decision-making. Then the decision-making process as a decision happens. And then discuss some context at the end. So topic one, decision-making systems. Now, depending on your background and the psychologist that you've listened to or the research that you've studied, you'll find that they say there's a variety of decision-making systems in the brain. So the brain processes decisions depending on factors and the situation that it's in. So I've just gone with the two that are most common um, because I think everyone across the side, most people across the psychology board would agree that these two exist. Um, so first of all, you've got the logical system, which is a system that you use when you have more time and you're under less pressure and less stress. And you've got the habitual system on this side, which is more related to when you're under under pressure, under time constraints and space constraints. So now if you look at a football match and we assess what kind of environment is, does a football match present, we can be pretty sure that you've got time constraints, you've got uh, pressure from opponents uh, and pressure on yourself and from fans, which heavily put you into using the habitual system, meaning that you use your actions tend to be habits as opposed to things that you stop and have time to calculate. Okay, so if we can agree that then football is a habitual sport where a lot of the habits and the actions you carry out are habitual, then one of our key objectives is to turn the actions that we want players to execute into habitual actions. So for example, if you're working with a player hitting a cross field pass or hitting a switch of play, we really need to teach that to be executed as a, as a habitual action, something they go to in a certain situation, whether they're under pressure or not. Okay. So I want to use this tree principle. So if you can take a look at this tree here on, on, the, on your right-hand side. If this is a tree and this is the trunk here, the trunk will represent 1v1 defending, okay? 
Now, if the trunk is 1v1 defending, that's the situation that a player is in, right? Then the leaves here will be the potential options that a player has to use when in that situation, okay? Now, the bigger the leaf, so this correlates with the nerves, but I won't go too much into that, but the bigger the leaf, right, the more likely you are to choose that option. So a habitual option, for example, for one player might be to press the opponent, right? You find a young player that gets in a 1v1 situation, they just go straight away to press with no thought or no strategy. That might be their habitual option. Now, when we go and coach a new option, so for example, the four S's of slow down, shut down, et cetera, we may now then start a new leaf in the brain, right? Which would be a new neural pathway on this side. Once we now start this new leaf, initially it's gonna be a small leaf, meaning the chances of them using it in a game situation is small. However, we can now grow this leaf to make it a bigger leaf like the others and make it a prominent decision when they are in a 1v1 defending situation. Okay, so that's what we want. We want the actions that we require of players to become the primary action when they're in a certain situation, okay? So here's three methods we can consider to try and grow the leaf, to make it, instead of a small leaf, a big leaf, and make it a prominent habitual option. So the first two are here in the, in the top line, repetition and realism. So having a realistic session design with a high amount of repetition is likely to increase the myelination of the nerves, which in essence is the size or the coating around the leaf, okay, which will mean it's more likely to become a prominent, prominent habitual option. Secondly, if we've got framing, so now when we teach the four S's, for example, if we reference it to defending in the deepest third in wide areas, so we, when we're talking to the player, if you can imagine, we explain, when we are 1v1 defending in wide areas in our deepest third, these are the four S's we're going to use. If you explain it like that, they now have trigger references. So when they are in wide areas in their deepest third, they can use those as a trigger to identify which action to take. And then the third element is starting with why. So there's a theory called classical conditioning, which is a psychological theory of, of behavior. And if we can start with the why of why the four S's are important. So for example, these four S's of 1v1 defending are critical because that's gonna mean that four, wingers are not gonna be able to get past you. And then you're gonna have an opportunity to be one of the best fullbacks in the league. That then now will create an association between being one of the best fullbacks in the league and utilizing those four S's. So if we can use, I think Simon Sinek's phrase for those that have read the start with why, uh, that can also be a key element to turn our, uh, the actions that we want players to take into habitual options that they're gonna use in a game situation. So lesson one from there is transfer decisions from logical to habitual. So can we, before we expect a player to execute any action on a pitch on a match day, can we ensure we've turned it into a, an habitual action? Can we make sure it's something they go to as a first option? So moving on to topic two, we're now going to look at the factors that influence decision making. So there's six here. We're going to go over the first five. Uh, orientation over this side is actually the first step of the process. So we're going to go over the first five and take a look there. So the first point here is principles. Now, lots of coaches will say they've got clear principles of the way they play, but quite often if the, you ask the players and you ask other coaches they're working with, there's definitely an area or gray area where in a lot of situations they're unsure of what the right decision is, okay? A second thing to know with principles is that whether the outcome is good or bad, if there's a principle, then they must stick to the principle. And I'm gonna give you a good example of that here with uh, Thierry Henry. So some of you may have seen this video uh, on YouTube or on Sky Sports when it was broadcast, uh, but Thierry Henry is talking to Jamie Carragher about Pep Guardiola's uh, three principles in possession, okay? Uh, those three principles were play, possession, and position. Now Thierry Henry was explaining how these principles are, have to be stuck to, but in one game Thierry Henry drifted to the other side of the pitch and actually scored a goal in the first half by doing that. At half time, he then went into the dressing room and thought he did really well. The team was winning 1 0. I think it was against Sporting Lisbon. Um, and then Pep substituted him because he broke the principle. So, regardless of the outcome of whether it was good or bad, the principle must be stuck to. As soon as you now adapt and say, no, it's okay to break the principle because they were successful, there's a problem. Um, a common example when I've worked with coaches is the one where they say, oh, don't pass across the goal, never pass across the goal. Now you see the centre-back pass across the goal and the ball doesn't get intercepted, but the coach doesn't say anything and doesn't critique it. 
So whilst I don't agree with that principle full stop personally for me, but if that is a principle of yours, then you have to stick to it and say, even if the outcome is successful, you broke the principle. It's the only way players are going to learn that the principle that it's a principle, not just a, a one desired action or outcome. So that's one key way to influence decision making, having clear, clear principles and, and sticking to them. Um, a second one is state, so emotional state. So let me just grab a drink. So a person's emotional state has a significant impact on the outcome and the decision that they sorry, the decision that they're gonna make. So I'm gonna go through very briefly. Um, a slide, this is taken from my book, so there's a lot of detail in the book regarding feelings, hormones, desire and behavior, but I'm going to just kind of give you an overview of how the state of a player, the emotional state, can impact the decision that they make. So these are a variety of hormones. There's seven key ones here, but there's many hormones that function in the body. And a hormone that you have a void of is likely to be something you're craving. So oxytocin is one example. Oxytocin is a hormone in the body which is heavily related to love and relationships and being part of a group. Now, if you have a void of that, so if you have a void of oxytocin, which may be from your childhood or your previous sporting experiences, you're likely to crave that feeling, that hormone, in a football match, for example. So a player that's void of oxytocin and wants to build relationships, you may find that he's a sharing of the ball, he gives to his teammates, he supports his teammates, he builds good relationships with those around him. That may explain his heavy emphasis on teamwork and work ethic, whereas you may get someone who's void of serotonin, which is like a hormone that represents importance. Now, for that person, they're now going to be searching to be the most important person on the pitch because it's going to fulfill their void. So now that person might be a winger, for example, now who doesn't want to pass to anybody else. He wants to dribble 1v1 and shoot without considering anyone else around him. So we have to be consider or consider these different variables when we're looking at the decisions that players make. If we can understand the void that they're trying to fulfill, we can then understand why they make some of the decisions that they make. So once we do understand that, we then have the power to then now use that tool, use the feeling to now create the outcome we want. So for example, the player that is searching for feeling important, he's searching for serotonin in the game, might be your winger who's 1v1, you can now use that feeling to explain to him that if he now combines with the number 10 and can play a 1-2 or, or combine and receive a chip pass over the top, he can still look like the best player because he can still score the goal at the end. So now you can use the feeling that they're craving to now influence the behavior that they're executing on the pitch. Okay, so let me move over to number three, picture recognition. So when you just speak to coaches on the sideline and you hear their frustration of, oh, why didn't he make that run? Or, oh, why didn't he see that pass? Well, the chances are the player sees a different picture to the coach for two reasons. One is that they're in the game, so it's, of course, far more difficult to see a variety of pictures. But number two, because as coaches, we're pretty, it's pretty likely we've seen more pictures than the players that we're working with. We've seen more pictures maybe because we watch more football or because we're older and we've played for more years and we've been a coach. So we've now seen a wide variety of pictures across different positions. So what's then key is that we now teach players these pictures and give them the key ones that we're kind of looking for them to execute. So I'm going to whiz to uh, my, part of my methodology document, which where I've broken down pictures based on positions to make sure that the players that I'm working with understand the key pictures that, uh, that I want from them. So I'm going to go here. So here's my fullback pictures. There's eight. So I've got key words for them. So as soon as I say the word drive, for example, in a training session, they would then know what I mean by that. They can practice it and they can execute it in a game, hopefully. So here's an example of drive with the video. So you'll see here, wing are pressing from the outside. I'll coach the player to disguise and then drive inside. Drive and disguise inside, so that'll be one picture. So now instead of being the coach who moans because this player just kicks it long because he panics or plays a part into a pressing trap, he's now got a picture to use to get out of that situation. Similarly, a second one is a slide. So now, if you have a look now, the wing is pressing from out to in. I'll show them this slide path they can use when there's space behind the opposition fallback. They can now exploit the space there. So I've got these pictures that we use for uh, that I can teach the players so they've got specific pictures to recognize. So I'm not that coach who's frustrated. I'm the coach where, they, where I'm quite happy that they understand the key pictures that I'm looking for. Uh, we move on to four and five, which I'll cover in a joint picture. 
situational awareness, which is how aware a player is of the environment around them, um, and self-awareness. And these two, oops, sorry, these two work hand in hand together. Okay, so we'll go back to that picture we discussed with the 1v1 situation. So now, first of all, let's have a look at self-awareness, which is the red part here. So how aware is player A of how good they are and what they're an expert at? So if this player is really strong 1v1, it's going to increase the probability that he should, that he does go 1v1 and maybe that he should go 1v1. If he's not so good in 1v1 situations and he thinks the opponent may be better, then maybe that tells him, maybe I shouldn't. But if he believes he's very good 1v1 and he's not very good 1v1, then you've probably got a problem with decision making because he's going to be believing he's going to be successful at things that he's not going to be successful at which can be fine if you're talking about a development background, but by the time you get to a first team level, self-awareness is absolutely critical. So let me look at the situational factors that could change. So what if the fullback is Michael Lofman? If that's me, I would expect player A to go straight past me. <coughs> player A must be aware that that's me and that's not a top fullback or centre back, so he's likely to then exploit the situation. What if there's cover behind the defender? So if there's cover that pulls in here, does that change his now his circumstance? Because now it's a 1v2. Is he still able to go and take on two players, one after the other, or is it a better is there a better option to circulate or keep the ball? And what if this player comes here to be prepared, support from behind, ready to counter press? How does that now change this player's decision making? Because now there's support where if he does turn over the ball, there's someone who can counter press and help win the ball back. But these are just some examples of situational factors that if a player is aware of them, he's going to improve his decision making. If he's not aware of them, he's probably going to struggle to make elite decisions. So then look here, there's three ways we can really improve this. So one is explaining the triggers. For example, uh, when the player is supporting from behind and is available to counter press, that's a positive trigger. We can explain that to the player so they understand. Two is session variety. So for example, if you do your sessions always against the back four, now, when there's a back three situation, does the, is the player aware of what that means for the space and what that means maybe at back post, what that means for the 1v1 situation? And then the last point is experimentation or instruction. If you're working at a youth age group, so you're working with maybe under nines, under 12s, under 15s, uh, even under 17s, any youth age group where your priority is still development, you can allow a lot of experimentation. You can allow the player to to experience going 1v1, experience going 1v2, and maybe 1v3. However, if you're working at the professional end where you need results, this may be an instructional situation where you say, anytime you're 1v1, you can go, as long as there's cover from behind. That would be, for example, one of my principles, that if you're going to go 1v1, I have no problem, but there must be cover behind to support and help with the counter press. So there's three methods there you can use to improve situational and self-awareness for players. Uh, so, in summary, there we've got there's well, there's five key lessons from that bit. So, take notes, or if there's any questions, please make a note to ask me at the end. So, can you create a clear set of principles with absolute clarity, where yourself, the players you're working with, and the coaches around you, and potentially management at the club, all understand the principles? Which means that at any given time, when a player is in a situation, everybody knows the correct decision. Next, can we align the player's desire with the required action? So as I discussed, if the player's desire is to be the most important player on the pitch, how can we align the action we require from them with the desire that they have? And then can we create clear pictures within your methodology, as the ones I showed you with the fallback? Obviously, as you move into different positions like midfielders, there's a lot more pictures to consider. Um, then can we use key triggers with instructional exper experimentation, as discussed? Uh, and then can we ensure players reflect on their decision making to increase their self-awareness? So there's some key lessons there, along with the first one. So we've got six key lessons so far to, to take away and discuss at the end if needed. Topic three, the decision-making process. So now we're looking at decision-making as it happens. What's actually going on in the brain at the time of the, when the decision is necessary, okay? Now there's nine factors here. I think I shared this on LinkedIn the other day and got some, some good questions and had some good discussions from it. There's nine factors here. Uh, or nine parts of the process. Um, I'll go through them quickly, but what's important is that the order is not necessarily always the same. Some of them are used more than others. In some cases, some are not used at all, but uh, we'll go through them with some screenshots in a moment to show you what these may look like in a situation. So first off, number one, orientation. Uh, we probably use this 
this phrase commonly. So where are they positioned on the pitch? What's their body shape like on the pitch? Which then leads to the next point of then what are they able to search for? So I, we often use the word scanning. For me personally, I like the word searching because I think I've often seen children scanning and looking around, but I'm not sure if they're looking or they're just moving their head. You see a lot of sessions or online of like a, a passing drill where the player is turning his head and I always ask the question, but what's he looking for? Because it's great to turn the head, but if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're wasting your time. Um, so from searching, once you have searched and you've identified some triggers, then it's the breakdown of what do they tell you? Because again, a player can look and find triggers. He can see the man coming to press, but what does that mean for him? What does that mean that he must then do to deal with that situation? Uh, then anticipation of the likely outcomes. So from that search, you've now had a perception and you've seen what that's telling you. So the players that are pressing in the space that's available, for example, what are the now possible outcomes of the next event? So what is the player likely to do? Uh, and what does that mean the, the options are or the affordances then are? Let me talk about predictions. So which one is most likely to happen, which is key. Well, elite players will be able to predict what's going to happen more often than the players that are less elite. So can they predict the next outcome? And then what part of the event must you pay attention to? Selection of the action, adaptation just before you take action in case the picture changes, and then action at the end. But I know that's a lot to take in, so I'm going to go through them one at a time now to, to make it a little bit clearer. But just before I go through the screenshots, some of you may be thinking, and some of the questions I had when I posted on LinkedIn actually were, but how do they do all this when they just have a few seconds? And the analogy I like to use is, is when we learn to drive, which I guess most of us have been driving for a while now. So when you learn to drive, initially you get in the car and you're learning to use your clutch. So you put your foot up or down the clutch and get used to using the accelerator. Maybe then you start to use your gears and you start to build one by one. But after months and years of driving now, you're using your clutch, your mirrors, your gears, your steering wheel, hopefully not the mobile phone, but you're having to drink quickly. Whatever you're doing, you're doing a wide variety of things all at the same time. Again, it goes back to that habitual aspect of now those elements have become habits. So they're things that you can do subconsciously without thinking. Okay. So now when you see all these nine, it might seem like a lot, but you have to imagine that a player, if he's been playing from three years old, He's been learning all of these tools as he's going. So that by the time he is 12 or 15 or 18 or whatever age you're working with, he's picked up a lot of these habits already, hence why they can be done so quickly in a short amount of time. So I'm going to play you a little bit of a clip here. I just want you to follow this player here in the middle just to watch his action. He's actually a centre-back who we put in centre midfield to get some more experience of perceiving in situations like this. Okay, good. Now we're just going to break down the action that just happened there. So we're going to break down the movement, the receiving from the keeper, and the next action. And we're going to look at those nine factors in the process that I spoke about. So number one is orientation. So orientation here. He's done well to get out of the line of the attacker, right? So he's now opened up a passing lane. But one of the bit of the feedback we would give him that his body shape could be open so that he can see more of the pitch uh, and then he could potentially play forward earlier. Okay, but that's a point just to raise of orientation. Searching, if you see here, you can see the checking the shoulder for pressure and for space is two of the things we, we tell them to look for in the build-up phase. Look for pressure and look for space. So you can see that scan there. Again, if his body position was better in the orientation phase, then he'd have a better chance of, uh, of seeing more when he's searching. Now the perception. So now he's received the ball and he's seeing that the pressure is coming from this side. He's now enabled him to take his first touch away from pressure, keeping his body between the player and the ball. So that's the perception part. Then anticipation and prediction. So because he's anticipated the player picking up speed, he's now taking a bigger first touch and started to move quickly uh, to get the ball away from the, the opponent and into some space where he can decide on his next action. Okay. So the anticipation and the prediction of the movement enabled him to take action and move the ball quicker. Now, attention, so in this moment here, what is he paying attention to? So obviously through coaching him, you know that he, paid att he pays attention to the numbers in the press. As again, one of our principles is when the opponent's high press and commit to it, there's space over the pressure. So if you see the numbers here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, five, and five plus one committed to the press, okay? 
He then uses the, he then obviously has to now play over the press. But he has an adaptation option, which we always talk about, it's really critical, is that if the picture changes last minute, so you can even see this player potentially about to change the picture. So for example, if that long option wasn't on that he plays, and this player here decided to press, there will now be a disguised pass as a last minute adaptation, which could come in here where the black line is. Okay, so we always talk to them about having your primary option and then having an adaptation option, which you can use last minute. I've got plenty of clips of the adaptation if there needs to be some clarity um, in the Q&A or at the end. Selection, so obviously now he selects his pass and then there's now the execution phase. And then I'm going to just show you how important that nine step decision making process uh, was to the, this action in the game. So if you take out that first element of that process of, of the nine steps to making that decision, then that one of the two of those that come out might mean that we don't end up scoring the goal there. So critical to understand the nine step process. And now what's really critical with this is diagnosing the right problem. So one of the reasons why this is so powerful is that I've seen coaches before who say, oh, the player selects rubbish options when he's got the ball. Okay. Now, a lot of the time, there might be another reason for that selection. For example, the body orientation is terrible. But now, if you tell someone that their choices are, are terrible, or they're making bad choices on the ball, but you don't understand, sorry, excuse me, which part is they need to correct, you can spend ages criticizing their selection, but actually it could be their orientation that's wrong the whole time because they weren't in the right position with the right body shape. They weren't searching, they then weren't searching for the right things, and then their perception was then wrong, which then now affects the whole chain. So when we're now analyzing and decision making and looking at why players make bad decisions, it's critical to go through all of these steps and try and find which one is it that they're they're missing up. One uh, a typical one, adaptation is probably rarely spoken about in decision making. But the pictures change so quick that if you make a decision early, there might have to be a last minute adaptation. If a player doesn't get that adaptation, the rest of the process could have been correct, but they needed to have that last minute change based on the, the change in picture. Okay, let me whiz back through, sorry. Okay, so lesson seven is just diagnose the right problem, okay? Diagnose the right problem so you can correct it with the right solution. Uh, topic four we'll go over briefly. Uh, it's just the decision making context, okay? So a lot of us, I think, work in youth development, or I used to work in youth development, and I, uh, from what Gary uh, told me, a lot of you guys and girls also work in youth development. So I just want to try and relate it to a potential challenge you guys might have. So good decision-making is based on context. So what's good a good decision for Leeds is not a good, necessarily a good decision for, for a Man United. And what's a good decision for a senior team is not necessarily always a good decision for a youth team. So what you have to do is understand the priorities in your environment and then relate decision-making success and good decision-making to your, your environment and your objectives. I want to briefly touch on youth development because I think if I ask, a lot of people tend to say they're very, very passionate about youth development. So if development is a genuine objective, then I think it would be fair to say that when players are developing, they need to complete the hardest actions okay, and make the hardest decisions. All right, so the players that learn to do the easiest actions throughout their life, when they get to a senior level, they're going to struggle to do the complicated ones. If they do the complicated ones early, they're then going to find complicated actions easier when they get older. So if for the next bit we could all agree that uh, at a, in a, in a, if development is the priority, then they should complete the hardest actions early and the easiest actions later, it would be good to just take a look at this clip I'm going to show now. So this is a clip, it's from YouTube, so anyone can go and find it. It's a Chelsea under 11 side. So I want you to have a look. I'm going to pause the clip in a moment here. Okay, I want you to have a look at this situation here. 1v1 situation with a player applying pressure from behind, okay? Now, a good decision making without doubt in a first team level is probably this one here, unless you're a top player at first team level. But if we're working with the assumption that you must do the most challenging thing at a younger age, so you must test yourself and push yourself to do the most difficult actions, then here, there may be better option available. And I'm going to show you an example of Sadio Mane in a similar situation choosing a different option. 
So here we've got the one, similar 1v1 situation, right? Defensive third of the pitch, pressure from behind, but look at the decision he chooses to make. He chooses to beat the player 1v1. So now if I then go back to the child option and we're saying he should do the diff more difficult things here at this age, why should the player not be twisting and turning to beat the opponent behind him? Unless we're saying that results are the priority. And this is no uh, relation to Chelsea specifically because maybe they had to win the tournament or maybe that's the way they work. It's not a problem. But it's just a question to pose to those that say they are 100% focused on development. For me, development here would mean trying to beat your opponent and get out of the situation. Okay, if I was caring about results, I would probably lean more towards playing the ball across to the other defender and then coming out the other side. So this is just a question about the context that you're working in and the priorities that you have. Now, I'll give you a bit of my context for a recent situation and how decision making became critical for me. So uh, the coach started with the under 23s when I was working with the first team. They had five games at the start of the season. They drew four and, and drew. Sorry, they lost four, which is red and drew one, which is yellow. And then the greens are wins. So in those first five games, they didn't manage to win. So I ended up getting a phone call from, from first team coach and the, and the management to say, I must go help the under 23s because they're really struggling from a development perspective, but also from a results perspective, because a club the size of Orlando Pirates in Africa could not be going out, even with the under 23 side and losing game in, game out. So the context I had was, I went in here, on the, this is my first game here against Maritzburg United, but I had two days to prepare. So I had two days to prepare for the game. I had under-19s that were playing under-23s. The age group had never played uh, reserve team or under-23s football before. They just came from a local league. There was no pre-season. There was no time to develop the player's ability as such, but what there was time to do was develop their decision-making. So we didn't change formation, and we used exactly the same players as the first five games. But what you'll see if you go through is that we turned results around completely. And we didn't turn results around by playing long ball football and kick and run. We turned by playing the, the way the club wanted us to play, which was dominating possession and keeping the ball and counter pressing and setting up higher pressing traps. We fulfilled the criteria of the game model, but we completely turned results around. And it wasn't because these players turned into magicians overnight or the player that was struggling to pass before now learned to pass. It was simply by streamlining and understanding the decision-making process. We made decision-making very, very simple by having clear, clear principles and using some of the methods that I discussed previously. So lesson eight is context is king. And being aware of your context and understanding your context is going to be what dictates whether you players are making good decisions or bad decisions. And more importantly, what constitutes a good decision and what constitutes a bad decision. So just a summary of lessons to run through. I know I've gone through a lot. Decision making is a fairly complex topic, but I've tried to go through things with some simplicity to, to summarize. Um, so first lesson, can we transfer decisions from logical to habitual? If you expect a player to repeat the actions on a match day, turn them into habits. Can we create a clear set of principles that everybody in the environment understands? Can we align the player's desires with the required action? So remember when we spoke about the winger who wants to be the most important, can we align the actions that we require of him, which may be combination play, with his desire of being the most important player? Can we create clear pictures within our methodology? Uh, for example, the ones I showed you with the fullback, having eight clear pictures that they must be prepared for. Um, can we use key triggers with instruction or experimentation? So experimentation for the youth, maybe more instruction for senior. Um, ensure players reflect on decision making to improve their self-awareness very very critical point this one players that are not self-aware are unlikely to make good decisions can we diagnose the right problem using that nine-step process so we're not telling the player that they're making the bad selection of actions when actually they've got poor orientation um, and then the last point context is king everyone's environment is unique but make sure you have clarity in terms of what constitutes a good decision and what constitutes a bad decision Okay, thank you very much. Um, as Gary mentioned at the start, my book is uh, available. It's on Amazon um, and it's also available for PDF on my website. So please feel free to go there. Um, I appreciate everybody for listening. And if there are any questions, um, I would love to hear them. But thank you very much. Fantastic. Great stuff. And I, I'm going to do a quick promo for the webinar series and then we'll move it into a Q&A. For anyone who is 
coming back for, for the webinars and enjoys the content. This is something that we're planning to do more of. Our model at Modern Soccer Coach is a little bit different. We don't have a membership program. We don't have a per monthly fee. We don't have a paywall. We put it up for free. Um, we don't ask you for a hundred bucks straight off the bat, but every now and again, we do ask for support. And this is one of those moments. So if you enjoy the, the work that we're doing, all the webinars that we've done throughout the summer period of the lockdown, those are now available uh, to purchase and order and download each individual. If you would like to support what we're doing and help us provide more free coaching education with the webinars and the podcast and everything else, please take a look at this offer that we have from the webinars over the summer. Coaches can now download every single webinar tactical presentation that we did from the lockdown period over the summer. Just over $1 per webinar, you can personally download all 25 webinars that will be yours to keep. Each webinar is over one hour long and features a detailed presentation followed by live Q&A with the coaches in attendance. We cover topics such as youth and elite player development, sports science, tactical analysis, match preparation, goalkeeper pressing, and other key specific areas. We had coaches such as Jesse Marsh, Nolan Sheldon, Ivan Beregi, Adin Osman Basic, Oliver Gage, Jonas Munkfall, Kat Smith, John Wall, and many more. ModernSoccerCoach.com slash shop. You can go there, get yours now, support Modern Soccer Coach, help us provide free content with our webinars and podcasts throughout the year. Thank you. Am I back? Yeah, top that was top class, top class. Really enjoyed it. Um obviously there's there's gonna be some questions coming in here. So I would first of all go uh and I'll start first. The the aspect of so much of it is is leading us away from we are naturally uh inclined to say things like you've just pointed out, like oh that was a bad decision, or such and such struggles with decision making, or why are they doing that? Um and it's great to open our eyes towards that level of detail to it. My question would be, how do you, because self-awareness and reflection are such a big thing, how do you as a coach kind of check yourself or how do you review this process, whether you're doing a good job of it or not? Yeah, I think I've been kind of quite fortunate that I've worked with really critical coaches. And if you saw some of the pictures on there, I had, I'm not sure who's aware of Michael Hyde, but he played in the Premier League. He was like my head of coaching slash mentor uh, slash friend. Uh, and he battered me a lot of times when I was giving, you know, like just typical remarks such as our oh, bad pass or what a he was killing me I, on the pitch in front of the players, which might be counterproductive from a group environment, but for my development was really important. So whilst I think self-reflection is good, I don't know how many coaches really spend time self-reflecting and I've had periods where I honestly haven't. But in those periods, fortunately, I've had people around me that have been very, very harsh. So that's why, yeah, some people push self-reflection as a heavy tool, and I think it's a fantastic tool if the coach is going to do it. If not, try and find people to work with that are really going to push you and critique you open and honestly. I mean, I, I think all those people on there I've had fights with at some point where it's been like it's turned into a real argument, you know, but that's how I've learned to grow personally. I think I have taken self-reflection in periods where I've had more time, but for a lot of coaches, when you're doing a session in the morning or you're teaching in a school, then you go home and you've got your session, you have the session done, you've got your kids to feed or family to see, like that time to sit and self-reflect can be really limited. So in, if that is the case, then I'll definitely just try and suggest getting coaches to come and observe, uh, videoing your sessions and sending them to people to watch. Because um, I think, yeah, some, a lot of the time when you get other people to critique, you find out things about yourself that you wasn't really aware of. Mm. Fantastic. So jumping on social media and, and uh, looking for accolades from, from colleagues is probably going to do the opposite then. It's probably going to lead you down. <laughs> uh, I've had my first, I think, well, I think one of them's in here now in the chat somewhere now. He's probably battering me about my presentation. So I'll wait for a phone call after this telling me how useless the presentation was. Because that's <laughs> the kind of relationships, that's the kind of relationships I've forced in coaching. But it's all been for benefit, you know. The, the more critique that I've had, uh, it's only made me better for sure. That's awesome. Brilliant. Um, Craig has asked, based on your experiences and research, at what age do players start self-reflecting on their decision-making? So it depends on how you look at reflection. So again, it goes into the conscious versus subconscious. So 
For example, when a player makes a bad pass and it's intercepted, he already knows that he's probably made a bad pass. And there's a reflection element that's going on where he's learning to say, this is not, in this situation, this was not the right option. So there's reflection by action where maybe the, the reflection is subconscious. But I think it varies depending, if you're talking about conscious reflection in terms of sitting down and evaluating, I think it really depends on the environment and the context that you're in. I think where I work here in South Africa now, they probably start reflecting very, very late in their career. I've, probably, I've worked with professional players, even international players that probably didn't reflect on their performance until uh, one of the coaches really put pressure for them to start doing that. But then again, when I was at Dagenham Redbridge, we had nine and 10 year olds that had a reflection booklets that were starting to reflect on their own performance. Then they'd go home from training and say, what did they do well? What could they do better? Um, so it really depends on the context. Again, context is king, but uh, I think they can do it from, from as early as they can play football, they can reflect. Obviously the questions that you ask and the level of depth you might expect could be different. But you can, I've had three-year-olds doing, like, doing kick-up exercises and ball control exercises. There's definitely no harm in speaking to them and saying, okay, what did you find really difficult today? Or what did you find really easy? And those kind of questions, they'll jump up and answer. I mean, of course, as you get a little bit older, you can start delving into more decision-making, ability, technique, tactics, and things like that. Uh, another Craig, Craig Smith has asked, and, and this is something I was, I was quite interested in as well, two questions. Um, the, the Man City clip that you've, that you've shown, uh, like that was a big one. That was a really impactful clip for me because... Yeah, as a youth coach, if I was in those shoes, I would probably be saying, all right, you solved that through possession. But I really liked how you geared it towards basically the, the hardest challenge, solving it through the hardest challenge. How do you manage principles with the flexibility and the freedom for a player to do something that's, I mean, do you just, at a younger age, I suppose, do you just move principles to the second uh, level of priority or, or how do you how do you manage that? I think you just change the priorities depending on the group you're working with. I think like it's you change the principles depending on the group you're working with. So principles for me are just an external framework. They're like uh, they're like uh, so you imagine religion, right? They have clear principles that you should follow, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do when you wake up, what to do before you go to sleep, what to do all day. They're just principles to follow. So like in the Bible, you might have the Ten Commandments, for example. There might be principles you should stick to. However, within that, there's still so much freedom to, to do whatever you want to do. But with uh, youth players, I would definitely probably, I would definitely focus on a key principle being to follow through the most challenging action you can. So when you're in a situation, try and find the most challenging action that you can to get out of that situation or to deal with that situation. And I have a lot of fights with coaches about it. And I think... Uh, even like, again, close friends that we, we had an argument today about the same situation where I'm saying, if I'm working with a nine-year-old and there's an option to play a cutback or shoot with the outside of the foot and put it far post, I'm telling him to shoot far post with the outside of his foot because it's the most challenging thing he can do in that situation. Even though the team might not score and the cutback was on and the correct decision by our first team football would be play the cutback, I'm saying I would rather the nine-year-old to use the outside of his foot and try and put it top corner. So... I would adapt the principle completely based on the age that you're working with. And if you work in a club where you've got like a Barcelona kind of model where you can have the same principles going throughout because you know that that player is going to play in your first team or that's your objective, it's very, very different. But how many of us work in an environment where you can sustain principles because they're going to apply anyway? But we work in an we work, most of us work in an environment where your centre back is going to have to learn to play long. He's going to have to learn to play short and play through the thirds. He's going to have to learn to fight. He's going to have to learn to kick the opponent when the referee. He's going to have to learn those things, you know. So using the principle of finding the most challenging thing means at some point a player is going to learn that long ball because he can't do it. He's going to have to learn to drive into midfield because he can't do it. So that's my perception on how to manage principles and youth development um, and changing through the ages. But if anybody works at a Barcelona kind of organization, you're doing fantastic. And... Uh, yeah, then it's a great privilege for you guys, but I'm definitely not in one of those environments at the moment. Yeah, oh, I, would, I would pay you a lot of money if I had it to, uh, for you to come to the US <laughs> and, try and try and maneuver that way of thinking around how we are looking at youth development over here. Because, I mean, I'll ask you that then. How much of it is down to the, how much of, of youth development coaching is limited by the opinions of the coach, of the mindset of the coach? to solve every problem or to have a set solution for a set problem? 
Yeah, I'll give you a really good example of how of how this can this can play out. So when I was at Tottenham working in development centers and stuff, obviously they were now putting pressure on one v one development. I'm sure you've had Chris on, right? And it's all about Chris Ramsey, all no. about one v one development at an early age. Chris on, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's all about 1v1 development at an early age, which means that in a game, they might their goalkeeper might try and beat the striker 1v1 under pressure, and they're going to concede goals from it, right? So now, then I went to Dagenham and Redbridge, and then I had I was the foundation phase lead, and I took my 9s, 10s, 11s to play against Tottenham, right? Now, our 9s, 10s, 11s battered Tottenham. I think one of the games was maybe 27-4. It was ridiculous, because our team had these beautiful patterns playing out the back, they were really nice. But which players probably now are playing for England under 16s, England under 17s, and are likely to play first team? It will be the Tottenham players. But our parents and our coaches were so ecstatic about winning the game that it meant that while their goalkeeper was giving the ball away and their defender was trying to dribble 1v1, they were losing the ball and conceding goals. But those players over the long term have got better. So I think definitely it takes uh, – the biggest problem is probably pride and ego because no one wants to lose 27-4 unless you've got real full support from – like everybody around you because I mean even as a coach to go home to your wife or to your kids and say what was the score today we lost 27-4 you've really got to have a strong a strong mindset to say we lost 27-4 but I don't care right it's a difficult thing for any of us to do so you've really got to have that pride aside ego aside and trust in the long-term process and then there's always cool support from everybody around you but I've seen parents that would probably leave a club just because they're getting battered even though the coach has got the right methodology for development so there's a whole parent education, coach education, player education, because the player might cry when they lose 27-4 because his schoolmate on the other team scored seven goals and he didn't score. So there's a whole there's a whole coating around it that has to probably change. But I think it's a long way off from what I've experienced in England. Uh, I'm sure for your experiences in the US also. Yeah, not a half, not a half. Um, Shravan has asked, are all football actions we do at subconscious level or unconscious level what exactly is the differences between these both so there's no like, it's very difficult to actually measure to say which ones are subconscious and which ones aren't so you couldn't exa unless you're going to put like a machine on their brain to try to measure the activity during a match it would be very difficult to analyze but if you look at it from a time constraints perspective of when a player is under high stress high time and high pressure they're probably using their habitual method to get out of the, or deal with the situation but of course, there are going to be occasions where maybe they have more time on the ball and more freedom to use a more logical approach. A typical example might be when a team is sitting in a deep block, the centre-back has the ball and now actually is actively looking up and searching to say, where is the block? Where can we shift? Where can we, where can we move the ball to to beat the block? Um, set pieces, obviously, you get more time to really stop and analyse and consider the options. So uh, it's difficult to find a scientific point. Maybe there is some research out there, but my my experience assumption from a psychological perspective would be that uh that the majority are subconscious and there will be occasions where players have a time to make conscious decisions Derek, non habitual decisions would be a good way Derek johnson has asked uh michael how do you look to focus players on identifying their own decision making process and altering their own habits within that so the, the, definitely the first thing is to have engagement with the player about the decision they made. Because often, again, if it's a habitual action, they're not even aware of the processes that we were talking about. So we go through those nine steps and say, these are the nine steps of a decision-making process. But those players are not even aware that they're going through those nine steps. So your first thing would be to have a conversation about some of those steps to say, okay, so when you were searching, what were you searching for? What did you think was going to happen before it happened? Did you think that was going to be the outcome? was there an adaptation you could have used just if that picture changed last minute so by asking those questions we're now again kind of bringing out this their subconscious in terms of what they're already doing and now they're starting to understand a more logical approach to maybe what they what they are doing in that decision making process so then that's definitely the first step is to have the engagement with them because again even senior players i've asked these kind of questions to professional players again international level and they don't have the answers for what they were necessarily doing or they're not even aware they were doing them but of course, every player is doing some of them because otherwise they're not able to make any decisions. So we know they're happening, but players aren't even consciously aware that they're going on. Perfect. How do you convince players to believe in the process? All in capital letters. I might have been, I might have been uh, supposed to shout that to you. <laughs> how do you, how do you find 
coaching rather than I mean a lot of players are used to command style of coaching I suppose so changing that how do you get that by him yeah I think the, like the real skill in coaching is if you can they don't see it as your process they see it as their process I think that's the that's really the skill and that's why I'm heavy on principles as opposed to instructions because just by setting our principles and saying no no you can do what you want within them here's some things to consider here's some triggers to be aware of here's some pictures so you can see but now you lead the process in terms of what you think is right to do and if you can do that you're probably far ahead of the coaches that are still giving instructions to the player so the player that once you're not giving instructions and you're educating the player really believes it's their process and you're just a supportive facilitator uh, in that um, so that kind of doesn't answer your question of convincing players but if you can avoid having to convince them by facilitating then you're probably a step ahead uh step ahead of other coaches if you did need to convince because of the environment that you're in i would probably suggest trying to align their desires with the process that you're going on so if you're talking to a center midfielder about having to go 1v1 and he's not confident he's scared of doing it if you find out what his desire is for example if he wants to play for england one day or he wants to uh, to play for man united then aligning that desire and saying that in order to play at that level this is something you're going to have to learn you're probably going to get more buy-in because they now see it as a personal benefit to them as opposed to something they're just being told to do by the coach yeah uh, Hamid has asked uh, a pretty similar along similar lines like what happens when you don't get the right decisions in those games I mean how do you review that with the player is that immediately after the game or is that with video uh it, it depends on the, like, his context I know it's, it's a boring answer to say it's context but if we have training on a Friday and we've got a first team game on a Saturday and we're doing some individual development work and the players making wrong decisions then we now need to fix that today and we can't even wait till video because we not only do need to fix it we need to fix it and then reassess it and that's the key part of the coaching cycle right is that okay for example I see a center back who is making poor decisions of when to play into midfield and when to play wide if, he, if he's going to make the mistake on a Saturday, that might cost us goals, so we can't wait. So I need to go in ASAP and try and fix that and then review it again to check that he does understand it before the game. So for me, it's definitely in, in the context of, uh, of that environment, you'd go in straight away. If you're fortunate in working where you've got a long-term plan, where you've got months, years with players in an academy system or a club, then obviously then you can go down, let them make the, have the experience. I'd always have a discussion maybe at the end of the session around some of the key decisions and then you can use video but if you can one principle i try and use is try and keep as close to the moment as possible so if it means waiting a few minutes or waiting five minutes or waiting 10 try and do it earlier because the moment is the feeling of the moment is still fresh and that's what you really need to do to change the decision is change the feeling that they had in that moment at that time because i think there's a famous quote i don't know exactly what it is but people remember how you make them feel not what you know what's the phrase gary you can you know you know the quotes you can share uh, they will always remember people will not remember what you tell them they will always remember what they feel that's, right it. Up there. that's it so the closer to the event you can you can discuss and influence the more likely they are to attach that to the feeling as opposed to just a logical thing that you just discuss with them uh, at a later date brilliant brilliant all right last two for you gavin mcleod what is the tiny metric uh, like ability or age group that makes you change the decision making encouragement for players for example encouraging the most difficult option what versus what would be desired in the first team okay again there isn't any specific timing metric i know that it's better to just it's better to search for answers sometimes but i don't think there's a specific metric so excuse me but what i do think again is your context of the environment you're working in so you could be working with under nines, but if your head of coaching says you must win football matches, you now can't ask your goalkeeper to run past the striker 1v1 because your head of coaching or your academy manager has told you you have to win games. And what are you going to do without a job? We're not fortunate enough to work in an industry where there's lots of forward-thinking clubs that are trying new things and experimenting. So you kind of have to keep your job in that situation. And I've been there many times before. So it depends on your context, on who you report to, on how much risk you can take. Um, if you've got your own academy or if i had my own academy up until the age of 21 i would still be asking them to do the most challenging thing i think uh for to give an example if you're playing uh if you're maybe you're playing a black back four and i think chris ramsey told me this example at some point if you're playing in a back four and you're winning the game at half time this is under 21s but your center backs they need to develop their 1v1 defending skills and they're not getting isolated 1v1 
I think he went to a back three. I think I'm sure it was him. Maybe it's another coach. But they went to a back three now because their centre backs were now exposed one v one on the sides. So now they end up losing the game, but their under twenty one players got more exposure to the development they needed. So that's 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 eighteen, nineteen, twenty year olds. So if that's not too late to be doing it, then I'm not sure when it is too late until the point where they have to step over the 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 first team line. So so yeah, maybe once they get to the first team squad, I would say definitely results. But anything below that, depending on your context, you've still got time to to modify that. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Craig has asked uh, about the, whether the benefits of street football is actually counterproductive to developing decision maker in the context of developmental football. I think the complete opposite. I am in love with street football here. I was at the December tournaments a couple of days ago. I think it's amazing to because what they develop at the young age is exactly what I was speaking about with the ability. So South African players in street football, they do the difficult things. Nine-year-olds here can do things that nine-year-olds, from what I've experienced in England, just cannot do. 15, 16-year-olds here can do things that players in England I've not seen able to do. The challenge then is what we have to do in South Africa is now we have to work heavily on decision-making between the, those ages of 19, 20, 21, 22, when they're going to break into the first team. Or if they're 16 and break into the first team squad, we've got a lot of work to do quickly. But if you look at the group that I took over for the under-23s for Pirates, those boys are all from street football. They had a little bit of coaching in the last few years before then, but they're all from street football in Soweto um, and Alexandra Township. So they're heavy uh, township footballers. But because I have a decent level of expertise in decision-making, I found it really easy to get them to make good decisions very easy and actually i was so grateful for the individual ability they had because i had players already that could beat players 1v1 for fun we had two wingers that were i ended up putting full back because they ended up in such advanced positions all the time they could go 1v1 all game i think if craig is south african and he checks the mdc team now uh then you look at like there was medisha and shorty the the wingers that i had played full back we they were unbelievable and the decision-making aspect was like the easiest part to influence, whereas I would rather have that than have excellent decision-makers like I've had in England before, top decision-makers but really poor ability. I know which way I would prefer it, and I would imagine most coaches would prefer extreme ability with poor decisions than uh, extreme good decisions but really poor ability. So that, that's the topic for uh, a chat for a coach or a bar or, a, you know, a coffee. <laughs> that, that's a, Definitely a conversation. Um, Michael, you've been really generous. Uh, the, the presentation, everyone, like I've got some messages on my phone and I'm telling them, listen, go get a book. Um, you've been really generous with your time. Let's, you know, are you a platform to, to promote, uh, to give a little insight into the book? Uh, any coaches that have had the thing up, any coaches that have not bought it yet, please go ahead and order it. It's an absolute steal on Amazon. Um, for any of the two or three who might be on here who haven't, let's get them together as well. Uh, tell them tell them what it's about in regards to or in, in the context of what you've already presented on. Okay, so it covers numerous topics, but it's basically giving the theories that you can use to underpin uh, to to underpin the work that you do on the pitch. So it's not a book where you're going to get session plans and design and session drawings and player profiles. What you're going to get is a theory behind uh, what you should be doing on a coaching picks, how you should be managing players, um, how you should be building a team culture. So it covers the areas that aren't really do your formal education. So if you've done your B license and A license, a lot of the topics weren't on there. Um, so you'll probably find that, yeah, this is stuff to support that and make you uh, help you become a better coach using um, a little bit of science and a little bit of theory. Yes, fantastic. When I was reading that, I had to... Uh, I had to the dictionary beside me and look up some of the words some of it's uh <laughs> silly about challenging the players you're challenging the coaches here to look into some to some different areas i love it so um highly recommend coaches go ahead and get it um don't know where you're going to end up in the next couple of months michael but maybe we get you on again and we, we take another uh another topic of it but love to have you on again and it's uh we need to do the hat trick very soon <laughs> Definitely, the hat trick sounds good. Let's not wait a year this time. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Hey, Michael, be safe. Look forward to keeping in touch. Um, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, all that good stuff. Stay safe. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, 
I mean, all the coaches where they've got all your uh, social media as well, so they should all be following you and keeping up with you. Fantastic. Cool. Thanks so much, Gary, and thanks, guys, for for checking in. Thanks, Have everyone. A great Christmas and New Year. Cheers. All the best. Bye, thanks, everyone.